you very much. Thank you. That was a great uh, summarization, uh, Scott. And um, so it's a, it's actually a great segue to these cases. I have a qu quick two couple of cases. So um, so basically, um, it's a 83 year old female who presented with bilateral claudication, right greater than left, and uh, has you know usual risk factors in medical history, and also had a right groin infection related to a central line placement um, not too long ago. She was hospitalized for sepsis, pneumonia. Uh, this is her medications, which, uh, you know, usual list of medications, got an ABI, uh, which was lower on the right side as compared to the left side, which was followed by an ultrasound Doppler um, that showed severe stenosis of the right CFA and bilateral uh, SFA disease. So um, this case is courtesy of uh, PK. <laughs> so just like Jose, I phoned a friend too. So, <laughs> okay. So this is just an iliac angiogram. And then... Uh, All right. So now, what do you guys see? <laughs> a chunk of calcium in CFA. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, based on what we just learned, so what would dictate your management? So would you send this? Would you would you just stop here? You know, call a surgical colleague, or what would you do? How many of you would treat this endovascularly? How many of endovascular? One oh, person. Just, just one comment. The only person who could deem somebody not a candidate for a surgery is a surgeon. <laughs> so you have to call a surgeon. So, okay. okay? Right. It's right. very, very important. I want you to know that because you, cardiologists say, or radiologists may say this, I'm not a surgical candidate, but that's not necessarily true. So, so you got to call the surgeon and let, let him or her assess the patient uh, and then decide. So this was assessed by our colleagues and, and they agreed that no, they didn't want to reoperate. That's very Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially given the context of a prior groin infection, which makes for a hostile, hostile groin. And that, in, in fact, that is one of the things that they saw in the TECO trial was le like localized. That was one of the reasons there was more morbidity with surgery was because of, you know, local uh, wound complications in the groin. So essentially that's, that's what they did. And they called their friendly surgical colleagues and uh, it was deemed that she was not a favorable candidate. So proceeded with um, treating it endovascularly. Must be doing something wrong. Okay, so this is just a um, uh, still frame of the same, um, a roadmap. And this is the rest of the. Um, so you see that there's just like the ultrasound showed, there is some um, SFA disease as well. Pretty significant. Must be doing something wrong. I just have to click the right, right? You yep. just roll the ball down. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll roll. Okay. And this is a good three vessel runoff downstream. All right. So, uh, so essentially, uh, so what what would you use? So let's let's start. Okay, axis we already have. So what size uh, sheath would you guys use? Six, five, seven, six. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so, so I always remember this, and I always tell this to my fellows that PK taught me that whenever you're dealing with the CFA, CFA, you should always have a bailout for stenting, right? So, if you need a covered stent, especially if something's so calcified, you try to crack the calcium, you have a perf, you don't want to be changing from a six French to a seven French in the midst of that situation, right? So, you go in prepared, you dress for success. So, basically, going, I would go in with a seven French sheath, and I think that's what they did here. Then they uh, crossed with... Um, but also there's a question of what's your treatment strategy? Are we doing adjunctive therapy? What kind of adjunctive therapy? Because remember, it's a big vessel size. Correct. So you have to think in it. Well, you don't want to start switching sheets in the middle when you're fully yes. anticoagulated. Correct. So like I said, think two steps in advance. You say, okay, I'm going to fix this. It looks calcified, whatever. What's my therapy I'm planning to do? So I think Asma that will is, talk about that. That is correct. Yeah. And the, the therapy that they used here that obviously would have required a seven French also... So essentially, you know, they, they crossed with, it looks like a, um, you know, ovenate wire and a, uh, a crossing catheter. And, um, and they, you, you see something, the wire was initially in the SFA and now you see the wire in the profunda. Why do you think is that? Anybody? So you have to look back at the initial angiogram and yeah. what, what you saw. I don't... Yeah. So you remember how the SFA was very diseased. So that kind of, is a natural protection for the vessel that if, if you know, they, if there is, they, you, you don't 
you know, if the um, downstream embolization won't be that much of a problem. And your SF, you know, SFA is just a conduit, right? And profunda is like the lifeline. We say like, it's like the lima of the leg, right? So if you don't want it, that much calcium with what you have there, and eventually you'll see that was the right thing to do. With that much calcium being there, you don't want a distal embolization in the profunda and that you could be in soup because of that. So you also have to think about the flow dynamics. If you have obstructive flow in the SFA, you can have preferential flow in the profunda that's going to be more brisk. So if you have any Absolutely. emboli, it's, it's likely going to embolize into the profunda on top of what Dr. Kalik had to say. Absolutely. <coughs> So, uh, all right. So, um, so wait, so before I go there, so what, yeah, so this is, I guess we, I summarized what they did, but you know, you have to understand that each of these things are well thought out and there's a reason why each of these is done, right? So uh, they knew that there was going to be a lot of calcium because of risk of dyslambolization. And you see there's a 7 uh, uh, a NAV6 uh, filter and on a bare wire. So 014 bare wipes is what they used. And then the next step is what kind of atherectomy would you use? You guys have any thoughts? Anybody? Okay, see a size, good choice. Okay, what size? Two, okay, then you, you would use, do it with a bare wire? Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, so what would you, what kind of CSI wire would you use if you have to use that filter? All right, but what kind? The 017 tip. Okay, good. No, that's good. Anybody else? Why would you treat distally before proximally? So, but, but the question here is, so remember, so, so think about the flow to the leg, right? So, the, so the, usually if somebody has rest pain and they have common femoral disease, mm -hmm. even if they have an occluded SFA, if you open the common femoral, the profunda would, would get them out of rest pain yeah. because of robust collaterals down to the foot. Yeah. So this lady is, is claudicating so severely because she has multi-level disease. She has both, both the common femoral and the SFA. So for you to go down and treat the SFA without treating the inflow Correct. wouldn't... Yeah. But I mean, you have a very obstructive lesion to get something through that, right? It's, all, it's, all, it's almost like a hair, right? So that's the reason. Yeah, you're, you're kind of leaving that as a safety mechanism. And, and like PK said, it's always like, that's the premise of treating anything in the, like anything in the legs is inflow before, I mean, uh, you treat the inflow before the outflow, right? right? Because there's more bang for the buck as in the so, more so proximal lesions. There was an iliac extent trial, which we refused to be part of because they told us we had to treat the outflow before we treat the inflow. So we refuse to be part of it because it's just, it's just not, not the right thing to do for the patient. So think about it that way, you know, in terms of uh, how, what's going to make them feel better. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So that was done. So the next thing. Okay. So, um, so then, the, then, you know, like um, uh, I wish I was saying, uh, Dr. Kapoor was saying that you have to think about your, your um, uh, your your uh, guide size, you know, based on your what what kind of definitive or debulking therapy you're going to use. So since they chose to choose to chose to use this jet stream atherectomy and the two four two four three four sorry that's not three five that's a two four three four jet stream atherectomy is actually seven it's, French. it's seven French compatible. So those are the things that you have to think of, you know, ahead of time rather than having to switch in the midst. So. Um, At that time, we didn't have CSI in the, in the lab. Mm -hmm. so my question is, you know, you've been doing a lot of these problems, Devil, and do you, do you think fibers changes the way you want to treat the disease? In what way? Where the calcium is? Yeah, where the calcium is, if you have any eccentric lesion, uh, you know, will that change you from directional? Because if some directional catheter will not go to that. Right. Would it change you? Uh, I mean, I, I think here the calcium was clearly internal to the vessel. It was like sort of that popcorn style calcium. Mm -hmm. So we felt rotational. Would you switch consider these days um, um, use of this procedure? I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, maybe some of the other attendings can answer. I, I mean, I use lithotripsy yeah. quite a bit. I use it mostly as an adjunct rather than, I mean, except in the iliacs, I use it as a primary therapy. But I think you still need to debulk in some way, shape or form because, you know, it just cracks and kind of, you crack and pave or whatever, it just cracks the calcium. It doesn't really go anywhere. Sometimes you still see like a chunk of calcium that's going to obstruct your ultimate whatever you want to do with it. You know, like stent deployment or, you know, ultimate luminal gain. I, I feel like 
it, it helps. I'm, I'm a big proponent of it. I use it for coronaries, for iliacs, for SFAs, but I, I usually use it as an adjunctive device rather than uh, as a primary therapy. I, I think CSI would be the best for this yeah. right now in today's day and age. Yeah. So, um, all right. So that was done. So, you know, slow pecking motions, be, you know, more deliberate, meticulous, so that you don't cause a lot of dislambulization. And um, so then this is the, sorry, I don't know what I did. My thing just had a seizure there. Okay. So, uh, so this was the post um, uh, pathway or uh, jet stream. This is how it looked. So you see that uh, you know it's made some significant dent in the calcium. There's still a chunk of uh, calcium there. And then, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so this looks like this is um, uh, a endosculpt, right, DK? Yeah, it's a cutting balloon. It's an endosculpt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just just to I guess uh, you know to help modify the lesion a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess a more uh, and further, this was followed by DCB mm -hmm. six so sixteen pack, and then uh, this is the result. And then I, I just wanted to show this. This is actually a pretty interesting. This uh, if you uh, focus on the filter picture here, then you know these are the cases you say, "Thank God I use filter in this one." You know, so I, I think it just demonstrates that how important that was. And uh, yeah, this is just, uh, I, I think that uh, they also ultimately did uh, end up treating the SFA as well. And this is just the final picture of that. Oh. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Right. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Great. Yep. All right. So. so